You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. La nueva marca Break Best Select Pro de O'Reilly Auto Parts eleva el estándar de las balatas y discos de freno para vehículos nacionales. Para fórmulas de fricción específicas para cada vehículo, cuñas antirruido Quitec y herrajes de acero inoxidable, elige Break Best Select Pro de venta exclusiva en tu tienda O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Theatre Thoughts podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all traditional custodians of the land on which our episodes are recorded. I asked her about that actually and she said she just really believes in karma and, you know wants to kind of give back and believes it comes back to you in another way. Yeah. And she also told me interestingly about the yachts. I didn't ask her this, but she oh, okay. said something like, um, you know, it looks like I'm having, you know, living the dream life, but I promise you most of it's networking and mm. kind of, you know, she never stops. It seems like the hustle kind of never ends, which is, right. <laughs> I don't know if that's empowering or not to know. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, if there's a place to go networking, I, I think a, a yacht yeah, and exactly. like a Arctic coast is the way to do it. You're listening to the Theatre Thoughts Podcast, your backstage pass to the world of theatre in Australia and beyond. I'm Justin, your guide through the drama, comedy and pure magic of the stage from the heart of Australia to the grandest stages worldwide. Join us here for enlightening conversations, reviews and behind-the-scenes stories from the artists themselves. Subscribe for your regular dose of theatre inspiration and consider supporting us on Patreon for exclusive content. Follow us on Instagram at theatrethoughtsaus and ttpod underscore official and discover even more over on our TikTok, Theatre Thoughts Australia. So join us as we rise the curtain on a brand new episode of the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. Welcome, everyone, to the first episode of Season 3 of the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. I am very excited to have two amazing performers with us to talk about a new production coming to the National Theatre of Parramatta. So, first of all, we have a first-generation Australian clown who graduated from NIDA in 2020, during which he worked on six Ibsen's Ghosts, Twelfth Night, and debuted the role of Amelie in the first Australian stage ad- adaptation of the film Amelie. Uh, they debuted the role of Shoshana in A is for Apple for Griffin Theatre Company and most recently performed Pear Shaped at Theatre Works in Melbourne. Please welcome Ziggy Resnick. Thank you, Ziggy, for joining us. Thank you. Wow. And we also have an actor who graduated NIDA in 2017, who since then has gone on to star in productions for the Sydney Theatre Company, Griffin Theatre Company, Belvoir Street and The Old Fits. They also appeared in films such as Pearly Gates, Trigger Happy and Top End Wedding. And some awards under her belt include the ATYP Rebel Wilson Comedy Commission in 2021. It is Nikita Waldron. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to, to both of you. Thank you for, for zooming in. Our pleasure. <laughs> Thank awesome. you. So um, I guess uh, the place we should start is to get to know, I know I just said you bio, but I'd love to know a little bit more about you. Like, so what are the, you know, the top things to need to know about Ziggy and Nikita? Okay, so you go. Okay, thank you. Um, (laughs) Goodness, I feel like you've really summed me up pretty well in the bio. Well done, you've done your research. Thank you. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Although I would like to flag my one performance for Griffin was actually on Zoom, so I don't know if it counts, but I like to think it counts. Yeah, I'd say it counts. Jackie Weaver was watching it, so I think that was one of my claim to fame. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I guess I just, um, you know, been really enjoying this ride of theatre, been really lucky. I think Ziggy and I both went through, you know, NIDA and that just gives you a wealth of connections and kind of a great foot into the industry. And yeah, but you meet so many extraordinary people who have different paths, obviously, along the way as well. And yeah, in the last couple of years, I've started to give writing a go too, which is how the Rebel Wilson Comedy Commission came into play. Ah, so right. hopefully next time <laughs> you can say I've had a play on that I've written. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. And I did see you posted a photo with Rebel as well. Yes, you. Yes, I did. Um, that was extraordinary. As part of the commission, she took me out for breakfast, and 
yeah, I basically grilled her and said, tell me wow. how you did it. <laughs> how did you make a living out of this career path? <laughs> That's incredible. Well done. Yeah. Well, I mean, she's, she was extraordinary and really big on giving back, which mm. I think is so important to remember. Ziggy and I are so early in our journey, but yeah, as we, you know, work our way through and build up our credits, it's important to remember to also like, you know, help those get to where you are even, which, mm. yeah, it's so important. Yeah, definitely. She's, I was actually going to say she's been giving back a lot recently. Like she's, her career lately has just taken this really massive trajectory. She's been on like yachts in bloody um, Monaco and the Amalfi Coast yeah. and that. And now she's got a kid. Like she's taking this massive trajectory and the Rebel Wilson Theatre, ATYP, the scholarships, the Deb movie. Um, like she's really going for it, which I'm, I'm really happy about. Yeah, totally. I asked her about that actually. And she said she just really believes in karma and, oh. you know, wants to kind of give back and believes it comes back to you in another way. Yeah. And she also told me interestingly about the yachts. I didn't ask her this, but she oh, okay. said something like, um, you know, it looks like I'm having, you know, living the dream life, but I promise you most of it's networking and mm. kind of, you know, she never stops. It seems like the hustle kind of never ends, which is, right. <laughs> I don't know if that's empowering or not to know. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, if there's a place to go networking, I, I think a, a yacht yeah, and exactly. like a mafia coast is the way to do it. Tough life, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Ziggy, what about yourself? Um, No, yeah. You d- did sum up this, uh, like, a, as, like, Nikita said, like, so early in my career, I'm always, like, when you get asked to do a podcast, I'm, like, I don't really, uh, I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> I wake up every day, say a prayer, and hope for the best. Um, but, like, yeah, it's been, a, I literally, I don't know how it's gotten to the end of the year, um, but, like, looking back on this year, it mm. has been so interesting like just on the last year where I'm currently like teaching Shakespeare at ATYP, like now in this moment. And like today we went to see the players, which is what I was doing last year. Oh, right. And this year I like went to see the show that they were doing this year. That's so cool. And it's like this way of like creating, I don't know, it's really interesting being, you know, in the industry and you see how, how these things sort of, how you always are in some way in this world, like whether you're like teaching or like performing, you know, with the players or on stage and then you go and you do a podcast. And it's it's, it's been a really interesting journey this year and I've sort of, it's become one of fostering and nurturing relationships. Interesting that you talked about networking, like really having that perspective where it is, um, fostering the relationships because like I did a, a show at 25A this year and now the writer I'm writing a show with and also I was just starring in um, their short film and also they're my best friend. So it's like, ha- like it's just so interesting that it, my life's taken this route of creating work and creating relationships that really feed you um, artistically, but also just in your life. Mm. Yeah. I yeah. Think. I think um, um, I have to, I with like the podcast and that, I have to really try to network. And my roommates always, he's, my producer is always, always just like, you got to network. And I'm like, I am honestly terrible at it. I'm so bad at networking. Cause like I'm in like a foyer and it's just me. And I'm just like, Ooh, Ooh, they're in a little group. I'm going to, hi, hi, I'm Jocelyn. And it's just like, it's the worst sort of thing. So like any sort of natural area you can network is always good I feel yeah and the like the it's 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 difficult I don't like it I really don't yeah <laughs> but like people that like I was like scared of like now are my friends mm. but I don't know some people are really like charming and stuff yeah but I don't know I like to do it like through the work yeah um yeah, totally agree but it's funny it's so funny. It is, isn't it? It's a weird, it's a very weird thing, but it's essentially now in our industry, which is, you yeah. know, kind of, yeah, interesting as well. Well, um, I'd love to uh, do the one minute theatre thoughts with you both, if that's okay. Um, yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> so uh, essentially it's like a rough minute um, and we'll do, since there's two of you, we'll do like a one for one. So I'll ask a question and then um, one of you can answer the other one answer and we'll go to the next one. And then at the end I'll jump back and I'll, pick apart some of your answers and we can see what okay. comes out of it. 
Cool. Okay, here we go. What has been your favourite production you've seen recently? Oh, okay. I also like Ziggy, the year has flown by, but I hope this still counts. Priscilla Jackman's production of RBG at Sydney Ah. Theatre Company got me. I don't think I've ever sobbed so much silently in a seat at the theatre, but, yeah, I've been thinking about it so much for the past year. I can't believe it's been a year. But, yeah, Heather Mitchell's performance, Susie Miller's writing, and Priscilla, who's our director for this show too. Yes. Felt like a dream team. (laughs) That's so good. Okay, uh, recently I saw um, Is God Is mm. the other day. I saw that the other And it's just so. so, so, so cool to see that kind of production being toured around Australia. I was just like, wow. Uh, what role have you played, haven't you played yet that you'd still like to? Okay, this is a tough one. I spent a long time thinking about this, but I think maybe Macbeth in the Scottish play. Nice. I think that the role that I want to play hasn't quite been written yet. I don't know, Ziggy, you can get mad at me for saying that on the podcast. <laughs> what? what, what? You're, you're, as you said, um, um, Macca's, your lighting changed in your Ooh, box. I th- oh, I, that. Weird. So I got distracted. <laughs> That's okay. actually really true. Um, anyway, yeah, the lighting in my house changed for the podcast listeners at home. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> as I said, the M word. But yeah, that would be mine. Iago. Mm, good. It good, is. Good. It is always. It's always a Shakespeare for me. I have like a list of Shakespeare characters I want to. Play. I love that we both picked a Shakespeare just yeah. then, without any pre-collaboration or cooperation. No. It's very good. Yeah, and we both picked male characters as well. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, you didn't say Lady Macbeth. You said the main. Well, when I was looking at the pre-interview questions, I couldn't help but think as well. Gosh, yeah, maybe our dream roles haven't been written yet. You know what mm. I mean for women. Yeah. Anyway. Yes. Name a play that's left you speechless. I really love The Harp in the South Part One um, that Kip Williams directed. I was working with um, Kate Mulvaney at the time, and. She was acting, but she obviously adapted that. And yeah, I just couldn't quite look her in the eye the next day at rehearsals because I was like, how did you, <laughs> how did your brain, you know, adapt such an extraordinary text into, yeah, a magnificent piece of theatre? I also was very early in my theatre journey, but I hope I'm not biased. You know how sometimes when you look back on things, you're like, well, that was five years ago, but it just blew me away and I think about it all the time. So yeah. I'm so excited by that because I have another link. Um, Tell us. I was, um, I have all my like favorite productions on my wall, but the one that like was really um, pivotal for me was Kate Mulvaney in Richard the Third. Oh, cool. Like that's, yeah, that was just it for me. I was like, oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's it. Good. I'll ask you two more. What's your pre-show ritual or do you have uh, one? Okay, so I do a vocal and physical warm-up and I meditate now as well, actually. But something I've really implemented is I don't look at my phone in that, ah. like, lead up to the show. Because, yeah, one of our teachers at NIDA mentioned it. It can really throw you if you get a weird piece of news or a mm. weird text. And I just kind of think, you know, it's glued to my hand on the best of days. <laughs> Might as well just have some space from it before performing. That's so true. It's so true. I, I've, I remember, like, reading a message before I've gone into a theatre show and it's ruined the entire production for me because I can't stop really? thinking about it. And I'm just like, oh, I've got to message them at intermission. Like, oh, yeah, that's actually very yeah. true. I like that. Thank you. Um, also, the vocal, physical warm-up and meditate – <laughs> like meditation is like the most important thing I've realized. Like it's the one I want to do the least. And well, now that I know this, I'm going to make you <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> meditate. Really so I would love to, I would, I go like, I get so hyped. I'm like a kid before a show. I'm like, there's the best day ever. <laughs> um, I still like can't believe it. And, but something I do if it's a really tricky character is I'll like draw a little piece of paper and I'll like draw myself and then I'll be like, bye Ziggy. Oh. And then I like fold it up real small and then like put it somewhere on my dressing room. And then when I come back, I can like un- get undressed. And I always have like very specific jewelry for a character, very specific socks for a character, very specific, like all my like undergarments and stuff are very specific so that I spend my time. Cause I wear a lot of chains in my day to day life. So I'll be like, putting back on my chain afterwards, cool. unrolling my little Z photo, like putting back on all my like millions of earrings and my rings so that I can at least like come back to myself. And it forces me to not like run outside and get a drink. Like, yeah. I'll like sit there and be like, you're okay. You know? That's great. I love that you do that. That's, that's, that's close trouble. You kind of like check in and check out. Mm. Yeah. Of your character. 
Yeah. Stanislavski would be very proud. The last one I'd like to ask is uh, which production would you most want to see come to Australia? Do you want to go, Ziggy? Okay, well, the life-changing, I watched a lot of National Theatre Live in my day. Yes. And um, I saw Angels in America that, like, Andrew Garfield. Oh, yes. Oh, that would be. And I was like, if that came here, I would just simply die. I would just, I would, I would just die. (laughs) I actually, I was on Broadway, uh, just visiting, wasn't on Broadway, I wish. Um, And uh, I know, right? Um, (laughs) I I was walking past the theatre that was in and um, it was actually at the time of the stage door. So Nathan Lane came out and I was stopped (gasps) dead in my tracks and I was like, that's Nathan Lane. And he didn't stop to say hello anyone, to anyone. He was just like, put his head down and just walked off. And I was like, anyone, did anyone, no, no, just me. Okay, cool. And I was just like, oh, that was a little oh. brush with celebrity. Broadway. Yeah. <laughs> um, Nikita. Okay. It's going to sound so cliche, um, but I guess I would have loved to have seen Fleabag live. Oh, like, I think you all agree. Yes. But I think that's probably the world's most overused answer. No, because not at all. Yeah, I know. She's amazing. And, yeah, there's something about that script has just kind of transformed what I think theatre can do, mm. especially for, like, modern the modern woman, you know. Yeah. And I have watched the National Theatre Live production at the Golden Age Cinema, which I loved, but how cool would it have been to oh. have seen it for real? <laughs> Mate, she's incredible. And, I, again, another connection. I, I, uh, w- I went to the Edinburgh Fringe this year, and if I had left earlier and got there on day one... I would have been at the media event that she was at to like introduce the festival and go and do flyering. And oh, I was just, I saw it on Instagram and I was kicking myself because I was like, I oh should have left earlier. I saw You're- that. I saw she like gave a pep talk to a bunch of the like Aussie artists. Yes. Oh, so do you want to hear my cool parallel with her? Always. So when I was in high school, um, you know, I was a passionate English and drama student and the deputy, um, would often say, like, you know, in a really encouraging way, you remind me of my student that I used to have in England, like, however many years ago. And I was always like, oh, that's so nice. Who is this student? She went to RADA, but she really struggled to get acting work, so she had to write her own. I think that's what you're going to have to do. Me, they're going, well, obviously she mustn't be very good at acting if she can't get acting work. Anyway, cut to the five-year reunion. She comes up to me again, and I'm, like, just about to finish night up. And this teacher who I really got on with, you know, I was so happy to see her. And she starts talking about the student again. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Miss Booth used to always talk about it. She goes, yes. And, you know, she's got funding from the BBC now. And I was like, well, to do what? And she was like, flee back. And I was like, wait a minute. Incredible. Your, your student that you've talked to me about for all these years, that's that's Phoebe Waller-Bridge. And she was like, yes, Phoebe. And that was the worst thing. Uh... But like, <laughs> she was Man. literally just like, yes, have I not been telling you how amazing she oh. is? <laughs> That is so That's cool. Insane. I know, I know. But, oh. you know, what gives me heart and hope with that is that, like, you know, you and I, Ziggy, Ziggy and I are writing a lot of our own stuff at the mm. moment. And yeah, the hard work hopefully eventually might pay off, but just that even the best have had to do it. It's like, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. I think it's really inspiring that nothing was handed to her and she went through the same struggles and insecurities that every other actor does. Yeah. yeah. And I think it also speaks very much, very highly of the importance of fringe festivals, you know, like totally. that, that's where she was found was Edinburgh Fringe and um, exactly. just went from there. Yeah. Um, let's jump back to some of your questions. So you said, so, so for your, once you've seen recently, uh, Nikita, you said RBG. Um, what was it yeah. about RBG that just really struck a chord? I think just watching Heather Mitchell physically and vocally transform into like 40 different characters was, yeah. I've never seen anything like it. Um, you know, playing a teenage version of Ruth, the oldest version, her on the brink of death. And then I remember watching her kind of and feeling, oh, my goodness, this woman is so frail. How is she going to cope? And then she, Heather gets up and does the bow afterwards. And you're like, oh, it's just Heather. She's fine. But then you heard, I don't know if you guys know this, but she had just been like um, had another diagnosis of cancer right before, you know, performing that production. Yeah, right? Oh, Crazy. Yeah. Um, and so she obviously, you know, fought through it and that's why they had to postpone the production. This is all public knowledge. So, (laughs) but yeah, I just thought even more so in awe of her in that time in her life to be doing that. I also love that there were so many parallels between her and Ruth. 
you know, they both had partners called Marty. They both lost their mothers around the same time in their life. Like it just felt like Heather Mitchell was born to play that role, but you wouldn't know it. And yeah, Mm. watching it, you're like, how is she so connected to this person? And then afterwards I realized how and why. That's incredible. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the stuff you don't know and that adds to a production once you know it. Like, totally. that's incredible. Yeah, that's and cool. Ruth had battled cancer and her partner battled cancer younger oh as God. well. And yeah, it's just, yeah, I love plays that make you think, my God, life is short, time mm. is fragile. You know what I mean? Yes. Or other way around. Yeah. No, I do. <laughs> you know I, I mean. That happens to me so often. I just go, yeah, and no, I'm quitting my job tomorrow and I'm going to go do this. <laughs> yeah. All the time. Um, yeah. Ziggy, you said is God is. Now I saw that on Saturday actually. Mm. Um, and I was the same. I was blown away by it. Like at first I had to like get over the initial production. Like I felt like I had to take it all in and really let it sit. And I was just like, what, what did I just watch? And, but it was so, um, yeah, I think I, I like what you said, like to have that level of, pro- of production touring, um, is amazing. So I'd love to hear what, why did you say that one for? Um, I think because it is so unlike anything else I'd seen. Mm. I think I love, like, you know, we all love a little kitchen sink day to day, (laughs) put the fourth wall up, give it to me, yum, yum, yum. But, you know, like this was something I just, I was so, even it's so challenging for an audience member when you're like, I've not, like, I have no frame of reference for this style. I have no frame of reference for this story and this world and everything was so it was just it was it was so thoughtful and then because I like know some of the actors in it and I was like what like what is up with it in Mm. terms of the script like what is scripted and what is not and then they showed me the script and the script is like it, it like goes in curves and some is big fonts and what? some is small fonts and like all of the ha 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 ha's are like literally written as ha 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 wow. and you're thinking like oath like period whoever chose that as mm. to be like the touring Sydney theatre company piece because it's so weird it was so weird it and was. it was so just like excellently brought together what on all fronts mm. Yeah. Um, like the music and oh, the music. Even just like the pre-show music, I was sitting there just like, I am so in the mood to watch this show now because <laughs> it was like banger after banger, and I was just like, whoa, cool. It is pretty intense. Yeah, also. very intense. Um, but yeah, I was just more impressed by the decision. the The decision for that to be what is touring around Australia. It's just really cool. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for um, going in on that. So uh, what we'll do, we'll take a quick uh, little ad break and then um, we'll jump in and talk about the production that you're both in. So let's talk about uh, Girls in Boys Cars. Now, um, this is adapted from the book uh, of the same name. So I'd love to know um, a little bit more about the show. So you are directed by Priscilla Jackman. Um, It features... uh, both of you in it, obviously. But if you could give it in in a sort of a nutshell, um, I guess without giving away too much, um, how uh, how would you kind of describe it to people? Ah, uh, little little peach tag. I think it would be two girls, like literal and metaphorical, like journey to discovery. Like it really is. Yeah, I would say that's it. It's 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 a because it's a road trip. Mm throughout Australia whereby these two girls are discovering who they are and it's it's like ugly and messy and gross yeah yeah I think that's awesome yeah so it's you're right it's a total metaphor for what they're going through as well um the thing that I always love about this text is that it really is set at a period in my life when I reflect on that time when you just finish school and mm. you're like anything is possible you know you really feel that magic Yep. right before you break into the real world and these two girls kind of break free of all their cultural and social pressures they have their friendship but their friendship is complex and a bit toxic but it's also really beautiful and yeah I don't want to go into too much about the dynamic between the two yeah, of them because I think yeah, of kind of like the exciting thing about it but yeah they really do find themselves it's like a, a journey of becoming I think yeah. it's what Priscilla said Mm. Yeah, people have, um, uh, from what, like, uh, people have kind of pitched it to me as is very similar to, like, a Thelma and Louise sort of story 
you know, rene- renegade women out on the run, discovering themselves, breaking away the chains. And, and I think that's very exciting and very, it sounds very fresh as well. Yeah. The thing about Thelma and Louise is uh, that I've, you know, in reflecting on year 10 film studies, yeah. when I did it. <laughs> but it shows that like two women do break free, but it's not without consequence. And I think that kind of, in a weird way, is still happening mm, today. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And, but it plays out very differently. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, there's a lot of like, yeah, gender politics and, you know, um, sexual oppression and just like different things that play out differently now, but it's still the same kind of themes. It's crazy. <laughs> well, I was actually going to ask you about the themes. So I'd, I'd love to mm. know um, what what was it that drew you both um, to, the, to the show and to the production? Okay, I'm chiming in about the Thelma and Louise thing. It's always an interesting like link that um, to make that because like Rosa, the character that I play is um, – like directly says like no, nah, it's not like Thelma. Oh uh, no way! Uh, and, um, so good because I think there is this uh, sort of impulse to compare uh, specifically female stories to ones that already have a blueprint, mm. and it's funny that that's I think a part of the themes like that we're trying to create new blueprints, new stories, new like new ways of seeing women. That's not just like. And that's what these girls are trying to do. They're trying to not be the damsel in the distress. They're trying to not be the girlfriend or the daughter or the like good girl or the or just the rebel. Like it's trying to figure out and for them, they're trying to figure out, oh, does that like even exist? And I think so are we. Like you're always trying to to have a story, have your story be something that hasn't, you know, your story is has never been told. But we don't know that because we don't know that we have the ability and the capacity to to go beyond what we've been told we can be. Um, I think that's one of the major themes in the play is that is 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 uh, breaking 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 through and like breaking apart what what we're told. Mm, I love that. That's so well said. Boundaries. Yeah. Boundaries. Boundaries. But I totally agree with everything Ziggy said. However, I reckon the audience are going to draw parallels. Yeah. And so there is a moment that I won't say what it is, but there is a <laughs> moment that kind of does a direct nod to the film because it's even, I mean, you'll see when you see the play, it's so different to Thelma and Louise, but there are some things about it that you can't deny are still unfortunately I don't know. It's like there's women are still like, mm. not granted total freedom and yeah. freedom come at a cost for these two women, a totally different price to pay. But yeah, I, it'll be interesting. Cause I think that Priscilla's aware of that like connection and she kind of thought, okay, I'm going to acknowledge it, but you'll have to see how she does it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so cool. Good. Cause it's, it's cool. It's a visual moment. Throughout the show. I oh, love it. Sorry. That's so exciting. <laughs> How awesome. Well, um, one question I would love to ask both of you before um, we finish up is um, a question I've been asking a lot lately and I'm, I'm really interested um, by everyone's answers that they give to it. Uh, so I'd love to know uh, how you both think the, the theatre industry, either in like Australia or as a whole, um, how it's changed over the years and how you think uh, those changes have impacted the work that you do and the work that you create. Yeah, I mean, I know that, in obvious ways like theatre is even more progressive than film in in this respect in terms of representation on stage I think that there's been a huge push in like the last five years especially of putting you know people like me who are a bit different and don't quite fit into um an ethnic box or you know what I mean um on stage which has been really great I don't know if I would have had a career that I've had, like, oh, I definitely wouldn't have 10 years ago. So I think that's a great push. Um, I also think, like, female stories are being told more and more, which is really great. But I think there's more work to be done. And so, like, I've always, <laughs> you know, Aziggy and I have talked about this a bit, but I'm, you know, currently trying to get my own play up and it delves into a very, like, specifically female journey of grief and I I hope that it gets a home you know in one of our Sydney stages but yeah it'll time will tell <laughs> yeah. that's great that's a great answer 
Yeah, look, it's it's so it's so interesting. You know, we spend so much time as actors talking about it and and trying to to fight to keep this momentum going. I mm. think mm-hmm. yeah. I think it's scary. I think it's really scary for a lot of people to see the industry change because suddenly these stories that we've been telling um, they're changing, and we want we we want it. You know. It's is got is is a great example of just like wacky style and like it's m- minority stories and diverse stories to be told on every front. Like it's not just like the faces we see and yet like who we see is so important and and um like casting casting accurately is so important. There's a better word for that. Um, it's so important. It, it's integral to the storytelling. But same as who we're commissioning to write stories or whose stories we're telling and who's behind the scenes who's bringing them to life the directors and who's who's doing sound and and lights and i think that the we've we've started the momentum of changing and highlighting and 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 hearing these voices but we can't stop and i think um it's really interesting in uh years ago i haven't been overseas for a long time but in 2019 i went to london uh and um, I saw a production of Taming of the Shrew where it was like gender swapped and there was someone who had difficulty hearing who was signed the whole Shakespeare and um, there was somebody who was in a wheelchair and and it was all just like acknowledged as a part of the performance. There was, it was um, made light of and it became a part of the story and I'll never forget that. And I think that, Australians we do have a lot of work to do it's it's something that I think a lot of people are scared of but we're we're seeing it we're seeing it I I've done some incredibly barrier breaking plays in my career like a completely Jewish story um where we like spoke in Hebrew and also a story that was just um an internet play about lesbians like Mm. Um, I do, I think that we are getting there. I just think the that we need to keep pushing the work. It's, it's as Nikita said, the work's not done. And if we just yeah. start to think that it is, then I think this the what uh, theater is arguably like a dying craft. I'm so passionate about this, so I'm, I'm sorry. No, so I love I think it. That a, like a big part of my work and a big part of my practice, especially in development, which I do quite a bit of at the moment, is getting as many young people into the room as possible. Because if we don't start getting young people into the theater, theater is going to die. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing I think is like we can frame this as a wonderful opportunity. You know, this time people are kind of on the brink yeah right? like it's like this could actually just be we could explode into like this amazing yeah. era of like we're almost there i yeah. think we can do it but it just has to come from yeah like z said it's it's you know it's who's in charge and like what you know what are the barriers to getting so- these sorts of different works up and we've seen it done overseas like england is doing amazing actually oh, they do. Like, yeah. so ahead of us it's incredible <laughs> yeah you like I, I mean only recently w- was there and just some of the stuff that i saw i'm just like god it's good and i forgot how good it was and i was like oh it's just so different but in like yeah, yeah and it, it, it's, a, it's a good blueprint to to follow and yeah inspire. yeah and yeah aud- audiences are hungry for it so i think you know i'm excited to see where it goes because if you think about you know when i got into night of I wish I could say I was like the first year of diversity, but I was actually kind of the second. Anyway, mm. the year above us was where the change really started. Right. We had Christine Landon Smith, this amazing British director, come in and just sort of she really was instrumental, I think, in being like, no, we've got to, you know, really pushing the change. And yeah, I just think it was such a wonderful um, hubbub in the school, like the yeah. way that you know, there were all sorts of different people coming through and it was a really exciting time. And I just think how far we've come since then, like, I I remember I did an industry day at the end of my uni career and, um, and we, we had everyone come into, to one place and this was back in like 2013 or something. And I remember very, and I still remember to this day, all the students from NIDA were there and I kid you not, all the men looked exactly the same. They were Mm -hmm. either tan or white with brown hair. All the girls looked exactly the same with just different hair colors. And I just remember sitting there going, 
oh my God, that's what night yeah. comes out at, at this time in my life. And then it's great to see them like change and adapt and take on, you know, yeah. that, um, that feedback. Totally. And it, yeah, it was, yeah, it felt really exciting at the time. I honestly thought I was like, oh, I'll be the only Indian in my year. And there were two others. I was like, what? <laughs> we all have to play sisters. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Well, um, thank you so much, um, Ziggy and Nikita, for jumping on. This has been great um, to talk to talk to both of you, get to know you more and hear about your journeys and, and also the show as well. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, to come and check it out. Oh, we'd love to hear what you think as well. Yeah, so yeah I'm going to keep an eye out for those little connections <laughs> and just, ah, oh, that's what they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully the Thelma and Louise moment is so obvious. Yeah, like, yeah. I'll be like, I oh, okay, there it is. Now in the theatre. <laughs> I'll just go, oh, <laughs> Yeah, make sure everyone in your row fully makes the link. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. All the best. And um, I'll hopefully see you both soon. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much to Nikita and Ziggy for joining us as our guests on the episode. Girls in Boys Cars plays at Riverside's National Theatre of Parramatta from 19th of October to the 3rd of November 2023. Tickets can be booked at riversideparramatta.com.au. This episode was produced by Echidna Audio. Follow them on Instagram at Echidna Audio for all their audio services. Once again, if you enjoyed our podcast, leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts and head to the link in this episode's description for our Instagram account, TikTok, YouTube and Patreon. My name's Justin Clark and I'll see you next time here on the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. Greetings, boils and ghouls. Tis I, Andrew Keenan Bulger, coming to you from the deep, dark recesses of the catacombs of Off-Broadway. My dressing room at New World Stages. This is Dracula, the Podcastula. The official companion podcast of the new Off-Broadway show, Dracula, A Comedy of Terrors. Each eerie episode, I'll be sitting down with the cast and crypt keepers, or, I mean creators for a phantom filled foray behind the scenes we'll be chatting about hauntingly hilarious onstage mishaps tales of theatrical terrors and unraveling the cobwebs of creation from the first scratch of the quill to the last blood curdling bow so gather round dear listeners turn down the lights make sure there's garlic by your side Gross. and brace yourself for a descent into the heart of off broadway's most fantastic comedy <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, down the wrong pipe. Dracula the Podcastula, wherever you find your podcast. Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network.